You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Maureen Callahan. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. She's got a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. And she has a full slate of services that now include beta reading. She's got four beta readers now. So if you're looking for beta reading services, she can definitely take on your project. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors can also inquire about putting their books in her book lover's box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. It's free to authors for a limited time. Be sure to check out Crystal and her whole team at Pico's House. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Thanks, Crystal, for sponsoring the show. While Cape and Spandex movies are breaking box office records, comic book commentator and influencer Ed Gosney doesn't want us to forget the roots of these marvelous wonders. His blog, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com, covers the gamut of four-color entertainment from contemporary comic books to comics made for kids to bargain bin gold to classics that will transport you back in time. Comic books are a perfect blend of art and story, and Cool Comics captures the essence of what these funny books mean to us in a personal way. And make sure to join the Cool Comics in My Collection Facebook group where members can interact, show off their prized comics, and have opportunities to win, you guessed it, Cool Comics. Published weekly, Cool Comics in My Collection aims to bring you a smile and reminds us why comic books are fun. Be sure to visit edgosney.com today. Speaking of superheroes and comics, my friend Patricia Gillum has a fantastic series called The Heroes of Corvus. It begins with book one. A flight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. This is such a phenomenal story. Uh, She has released up to part four now, and I cannot wait for part five to come out. If you're looking for a great adventure read that's uh, on the cutting edge of what is in today's entertainment, The Heroes of Corvus is the series for you by Patricia Gillum. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. We're on just about every platform you can imagine. Now stay tuned for our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Maureen Callahan on the show. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called American Predator. And, you know, we jokingly say from time to time that a book keeps you up at night uh, because it's so engaging and you just can't put it down. This book will keep you up at night for more than that reason. I promise you. Um, Maureen, this is such an amazing read. Um, the the research and everything that went into it, I, I can't wait to talk to you about. Um, but welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Hank, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you. Well, we uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I love that question. Um, when I was in elementary school, uh, fourth grade, um, we had this sort of mandatory uh, project we all had to do. It was part of something called the Young Authors Club, and you had to write a story um, like like a, like a little one, like your little kid, you're writing a little story. Um, and then you had to type it out 
uh, and you had to design your book jacket and you had to sew your pages together and bind your book. Um, and so it was sort of a front to back experience in, in creating a book. And, um, it, it came pretty easy to me. And, uh, and, um, and, and I, I was encouraged, um, from a young age and among my writer friends, I, I don't often find this as a commonality and I, I feel really lucky for it. Um, but I was encouraged from a, a young age by my parents and by teachers to pursue writing professionally, which, you know, most people will tell you and have a backup plan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was lucky. Uh, I was very, very lucky in that regard. Um, so yeah, I, and I've been, you know, um, it like, like a, a voracious reader since I, I was able to, I mean, I remember as a little kid just dying to learn how to read. I, I've been a voracious reader for as long as I've been a conscious human being on the planet. I, I love to hear those stories, um, especially those stories of early encouragement, uh, because we, we talk so much on the show about the the dark days, uh, the lonely days of being a writer. And, you know, the, you you make this thing for the world, but uh, a lot of times there's months and years spent creating this thing completely alone and with with almost no feedback from people. And those those early memories of of encouragement that a, a, a parent or a teacher or, or someone recognized the gift uh, those those things you you draw back uh, upon your whole life, and uh, I, I love that you you have that story where people recognize that and encouraged you all along the way. That is such a rare gift. It really is, especially, and I'm sure you've heard this from just about every author you've interviewed. When you're in the throes of your first draft, which everyone will tell you, everyone, the first draft, it, it's going to suck. It's going to be hot garbage on fire, and you have to push yourself through that first draft and the and and the humiliation and the embarrassment of submitting it to your editor and having your editor very kindly help you write this ship, you know. And um, you, 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 the only thing you can do is just keep going um, and and remind yourself that you know you've you've done it before um, and you'll you'll get it done again. But um, it is every single time you sit down to do it, it's it's really terrifying. Um, so yeah, it it is it is a it is a wonderful thing. I I I know writers who have had the opposite um, experience growing up, and it it's still it's 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 like a a psychic wound that never goes away. That that doubt still haunts them. Well, as someone who who was encouraged and who um, who was looking toward a writing future, uh, what was your path after school? How did you? Uh, work your way into the industry, and, and did you, did you have an idea of the kind of writing that you really wanted to do? It's really interesting. I wasn't sure, but I knew a couple of things. I um, I grew up on Long Island, and I knew I wanted to go to school in New York City um, because I knew that New York City was going to be a great teacher, and I also wanted to go to school in New York City because it's the media capital of the world, and I was going to work in media. Um, I had a problem in as much as my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. <laughs> um, and so I applied for scholarships, and I won a four-year scholarship to study journalism in New York. And I took it because I also I had this sort of long-range plan that – when I got out of college, I wanted to be able to take a job in an industry that was infamously low paying, but I did not want to have to worry about student debt or paying anybody off. I wanted to be able to take the lowest paying but best, most rewarding entry level gig I could find. Um, and I also uh, was intent on working while I was in college. I got two internships. Um, one in print and one in broadcast because I was toggling between the two. I didn't know which I wanted to pursue, and then I very quickly landed on print. Um, I just prefer writing, and I prefer long-term uh, – so, sorry, long-form storytelling. Um, and uh, those two internships uh, landed me job offers right out of school. So um, I, 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 I just – I knew I wanted to hit the ground running, and especially in New York where – you're competing with people who are 
you know, hungry and smart and ambitious, you know, you, you really have to um, do what you can as, as fast as you can to, to begin making your way. When uh, it, it sounds like that you uh, were able to uh, to get into the um, uh, the industry without rose colored glasses, it, it seems like that you um, you know working through school and and having a goal. Um, you know, a, a lot of people have these unreal expectations, but it sounds like you were able to uh, dodge a lot of that. I think it was more knowing that I was going to be in for a, a long, sustained period of grunt work and that the way I was going to distinguish myself was to just show up every day and be like the first one there and the last one to leave and do anything with a smile on my face and uh, just work harder than anyone else. And that went so far. That got me... I mean, people really began to take me under their wing and teach me things. And uh, it was really, it was yet another education. Um, and uh, it's, it's in that real world experience. It's, it's invaluable. Um, and it's what I take note of even now when I see younger people coming in the doors of the post, you know, who sort of thinks things should sort of just, be handed to them and, and who's willing to just sort of put their head down and work really hard and then, and wait for, for the, wait for their own sort of maturation to, to get noticed. Sure. Sure. And, and you are a, a columnist uh, at the post now, is that right? Yeah. Um, my formal title is critic at large, but I think they're I pretty that. much interchangeable. Oh, yeah. yeah. It sounds, it sounds cool. It think, does. It does. They're, they're pretty much interchangeable. And I write about, um, I, it's great because I, I am a generalist and I, I have very Catholic interests, so I get to write about just about anything and everything um, that captures my interest in any given week. Well, and and speaking of which, you you had a um, uh, a book that really um, got a lot of attention a couple of years ago, Champagne Supernovas, uh, and then the new book, of course, American Predator. Um, I think you've also done some biography work um, when you're. Uh, you, you know, when when someone looks at your body of work, um, you know they're, they're probably like, "Wow, Maureen's kind of she has such varied interest." Um, and speaking of, you know, kind of that very Catholic, you know, small C um, view of the world. Um, how do you, if, if someone asks what kind of of writing uh, you do or, or what your specialty is, what do you tell people? That's really interesting because I, it's. It's hard to say. Um, you know, the columns are sort of opinion pieces, um, and I'm trying to approach a topic that is like front of mind for for most people who are consuming the news. But it, it coming at it in, in a way that's original. I never want to say something if I don't feel I have something really to say to add to the conversation um, with. The books, um, it's, I think of it as sort of a really long form reportage. Um, and with this most recent book in particular, American Predator, um, it was a real challenge uh, in reporting it, partly because the federal government is still keeping much of this case uh, secret. So I had I had to fight for a lot of information, and um, I was even learning things at this stage in my career about how how you how you get what is ostensibly uh, public information um, out of out of the hands of 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 the government when when they're intent on hiding it. Um, and I also really wanted it to be a very immersive experience for the reader. Um, I wanted the reader to be really feeling like they're right alongside these FBI agents and and uh, members of law enforcement as they're investigating these crimes and coming to these realizations uh, a at the same time. Um, and that I'd never really done that kind of writing before. Um, it's a there, there's a definite. It's interesting. I, I had an editor who who was like, you know, you 
you are the writer. You are allowed to say exactly what happened in the in the way that you want to say it. You're not you're not you're not altering any of the facts of the story, but it's in the way that you tell the story that right. makes all the difference. Um, and so that I, I, that's what I set out to do with this, and and hopefully I succeeded. Um, oh, you absolutely yeah. did. Thank you. Um, it was the hardest one yet. Yeah. I'm a big fan of long form journalism, especially done the way you do it. Uh, in, in by that I mean, in a sort of narrative nonfiction way, um, where we are engaged in the story. You you paint characters, these real life people, like they are, um, you know, larger than life characters, which which most are. But you know, we we kind of. We're attuned to watching the news and watching daily events that have been reduced to bullet points and reduced to, you know, just the facts, ma'am, uh, kind of stuff. And we rarely get the opportunity to really dive into what makes people tick and, and the, you know, the, the and, and all the characters in the story. Um, one of the things about American Predator is that it reads like a novel, and, and I mean that in the best sense, um, that it is an absolute page turner. And all through the book, you know, I, I would catch myself, you know, lowering the book and going, oh my God, this cannot be real. This, this, you know, if, if this is real, um, I'm really worried about the world we live in and I'm worried about my neighbors. And, you know, and, and to, to capture that emotion and to, to uh, tap into my fear and uh, things like that is just amazing. Um, what was it about this story that grabbed you? And I, I know this had to have occupied a good portion of your life to uh, have gotten this project done. Um, what was it that that drew you? And did you know that you would wind up going as deep on this as you did? Well, first of all, thank you for those very kind words. Um, I did not I I went in I didn't go in sort of thinking uh, okay I'm going to get this done in a year or even maybe two um I did not anticipate how difficult it would be to to really root out the information that I needed and part of it was you know I had the the FBI agreed to cooperate with this book almost immediately um, and they, they felt as I did that a book might really help, uh, identify and locate more victims. Um, and they gave me this level of, of access to the case agents that one of them later told me was unprecedented in his 20 plus years with the Bureau that he'd never seen a journalist given such access. So in that respect, I, I went in feeling pretty good because I, I really did want to understand and depict what it's like to be an investigator on a case of this magnitude. Um, what was really difficult was, so the FBI had this very official, narrow version of events that they stuck to. And it only was the first half of the story. And the second half of the story was complete. It was. I described it as just a, a, a vast white tundra. It, it was literally. Here's his last court appearance, which, by the way, resulted in an escape attempt that was a huge black eye to the FBI. And 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 then what the end of the story is, which I, I don't necessarily want to give away to your readers, but um, and your listeners, but uh, it, it there there was nothing there, and I. I I I knew only that something had to have gone horribly wrong for half of the story to be complete white space. Right. And so that resulted in in the in the in suing the federal prosecutor and and spending thirty thousand dollars of my own money and demanding these you know interviews that they were hiding with him be released to me and and uh, that part of the adventure. Wow. Um, uh, by the way, I want to apologize. The, the power company just decided they needed to trim tree limbs right outside my office. So um, I'll, if there's a distracting noise in the background, I'm going to edit that out. I apologize. No problem. Um, I can't hear a thing. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you first hear about this story? Because this was uh, this was a massive 
story that I and everyone I've talked to about it um, has heard almost nothing about. Um, where did uh, how did you get plugged into this story? I first came across this story. I stumbled upon it. I was at work one day and just rooting around online and stumbled upon this short story about this serial killer that had this unprecedented modus operandi that the FBI had never seen before. Oh, and by the way, they've had him in federal custody for the past nine months, but we're just telling you about his very existence now, even though he spent the last 14 years roaming around the United States killing people. Um, and that seemed like a story to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it seemed like there were multiple stories probably contained therein. Yeah. And so um, I immediately started reporting it out for the Post. Um, and I got in touch with some of the investigators and some of the federal prosecutors, one in Alaska, one in Vermont. Um, that it was on opposite ends of the country. An active investigation was also fascinating. Um, and I wrote it as a story for the Post, and I just couldn't shake it. I, ju I was just obsessed with it, and I knew I wanted to, to do a book. Did did um, uh, so it began as a project for the Post? That oh, mm -hmm. th this is something that caught my attention. I'm going to write about this. Um, how long did it take before you realized that this this needed to be a book? Probably a couple of weeks. Okay. So pretty quickly. Um, pretty quickly. I remember coming back from winter break and saying to my editor, like, I really think this is a book. And I think this is my book. I, I always know. I mean, I I am riddled with as much self-doubt as any other writer. But the one thing I know for certain is I have a good idea when I become paranoid that somebody else is going to have the exact same idea and they're going to beat me to it. And that fear plagued me. It took me, cause I was, I was working on another book and, and I had to finish that one first. Um, but, uh, it, it plagued me until I was able to, to get, get this out and start shopping it around because I, I could not, I just wanted to hit the ground running on this story. What year was this uh, that all this began? 2013. Wow, six years uh, yeah. ago. That's, uh, that is a huge commitment. Um, did you uh, – well, of course you didn't know all that you were going to get into because that's some of the, the best part of the book is all, all the, the twists and turns. Uh, that happened, but did you immediately start reaching out to law enforcement? I know that that initially they gave you kind of what seemed like carte blanche, uh, but then things started going a little awry. Uh, can you talk about about that a little more? Yeah, of course. Um, so for the first year and a half, I was doing really uh, intense, detailed interviews with um, the agents who worked this case the most closely. So the two lead ones, I had these standing weekly uh, phone interviews with, um, and they would go for at least an hour, often more. Um, I wanted them to walk me through the case, like beginning to end in a lot of detail. Um, and at the same time, I was I had filed a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request with the Department of Justice for the case files. Um, and the DOJ became pretty um, – it, it became clear from their, their response that they were not really willing to play ball. And so I, I had these two different experiences. On the one hand, I'm, I'm having these – really intense, detailed conversations with the agents who are, are telling me things that uh, have not been made public. And then I've got the Department of Justice saying I can't have these files or it's going it's to take forever. Um, and this was a case, by the way, that was so recent and so high profile and, and was such a, such a priority at Quantico that I knew there was no way that th they didn't know exactly where these case files were. Um, and then what happened was, uh, and this becomes a sort of plot point in the book, um, when you're interviewing FBI agents, it's, it's really tricky because these are people who are so skilled at getting information out of people and not letting on what they know or don't know. Um, but they did let slip to me that um, the federal prosecutor on this case had gotten out of control excuse me, had gotten out of control, had seriously jeopardized the investigation, had 
it became very clear. Um, I obtained the initial confession to uh, the crime they arrested him on, which was in connection with the disappearance of this 18-year-old barista in Anchorage, Samantha Koenig. Now, that confession has never been logged anywhere either. I was, I was able to obtain it from a, a source who wished to remain anonymous. But the reason they no, didn't make that uh, interrogation public, I am convinced, is because throughout it, uh, you can see and watch as the federal prosecutor who insists on leading this crucial interrogation to get a confession out of a guy they have very little evidence on nearly botch it. And if he botches it, this guy who they know has killed before, like they can just tell, is going to walk out of that room a free man, and he's going to disappear, and he's going to go do it again. And so you can – in the book, you read as through that interrogation as it's happening, and you can see where it's eroding, and you can you – can, I really try to depict – because I would – ask the case agents over and over, tell me what you were thinking at this point. Tell me what you were feeling. Tell me. So when the thoughts of someone are described in the book, it's, it's, it's based on information they gave me directly. And I really wanted to depict the way the lead case agent was like just dying inside because he can't show his cards to this suspect that there's division in the room about how to run this interrogation, but he's got to very artfully wrest control of it back so that he can get this guy to confess. What is uh, what's so scary about that? Because you you do clue us in to um, to to what's going on as the the story is unfolding. Um, we are in a time now where um, true crime uh, is uh, really on on everyone's minds. There's some you know fantastic documentaries on on Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and stuff that that show the, the legal system gone wrong uh, in a lot of cases and and I think more people are are cognizant of the the ways that that justice can be mishandled um, so then you 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 know a lot of us have that in our mind and then you read a story like this where um, there's there's really no doubt in our minds that that this person is guilty and needs to go away. Um, but, you know, you've got this tightrope of, you know, does does justice have to be blind even when we know that, you know, that this, that this thing is happening? Um, it's really this uh, this really emotional roller coaster um, that you lead us on, um, you know, to 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 really see how justice plays out and to to always be thinking about about real justice um, that as you started digging into that did you realize that that was going to become uh, kind of a, a story point a plot point it's such an interesting thing because that really emerged organically um, I knew something had gone on but I, I, I didn't think it was to that extent and to that magnitude um, one of the things that I think is is a key part of the story is, you know, for most of us, if we lead our lives correctly, we're never going to interface with the criminal justice system in America. Um, or or we so hope not. We, or we hope not. And we, we therefore really have no idea how it runs, what goes on behind closed doors. What deals are cut? Now, one of the the things that um, one of my sources told me very early on, before I even began writing this book, but I, I, I kept in contact with people after I did the first story for The Post. And it was really sensitive information because it goes to another black eye for both the FBI and the DOJ, which was that Israel Keyes made it very clear he wanted the death penalty, and he wanted it fast. He wanted it in a year's time. And if they would make that happen, he would give them the names and locations of his other victims. And that was something that it became uh, – it was just one indication of – what goes on in terms of negotiations behind closed doors. The question then becomes if someone like him 
is demanding an outcome that he knows he will get even if this case goes to trial, uh, why can't the federal government make that happen? He cited the case of Timothy McVeigh, uh, opens another can of worms in the book. It's yet another part of the story. But he references Timothy McVeigh saying to, to federal prosecutors, I want the death penalty. Make that happen for me fast. And they did. And he said, I don't understand why I can't have it. You want, you want all this information that's so valuable to you. Give it to me. It's so bizarre. <laughs> I know. I uh. know. Um, Which then turns into this real cat and mouse game uh, where he's he's truthful and not truthful and, and I guess behaving exactly like we would expect a serial killer to behave. And he's also dropping breadcrumbs along the way. And he's he's taunting them with little bits of information. You know, the the initial part of the investigation for all of the – the botch job that the uh, federal prosecutor uh, was was executing quite well. Um, the investigators themselves did amazing work. They got three confessions out of him in one week's time. That's amazing. But after that, and in part because of these interrogations going awry, he then very quickly realizes, oh my God, like I, I he told them, you will never find a body without me. But it wasn't until the, the final confession where he realized that that was actually true. He thought the FBI had more on him than they did, and that was due to the very artful machinations of FBI Special Agent Steve Payne. He was the lead investigator who knew how to do that kind of thing. Um, and you, you can see his methodology all throughout the book. But um, – he was he was as the as the case sort of went along, Keys would drop these very little tantalizing bits of information to sort of tease them. And and one of the investigators in particular, Jeff Bell, took it as a personal challenge. There was a period of time where Keys stopped talking to them, and uh, it was Jeff Bell was intent on identifying and locating another victim without his help to prove to him that they could do it. And he did it. Wow. What did you learn about Israel Keys um, in in writing this? Do you, I know you're not a psychological profiler, and, and and you know that like these these people that work for the FBI and the the, the kind of heroes that we uh, that we read about and see. But what did you discover about Israel Keys? Were, were there any clues that that might um, you know, clue us into the people around us. Uh, is, is this just a random act of psychosis? Um, wh what did you come away with feeling about him as a person and the kind of people that, that do this sort of thing? Well, uh, one of the people I talked to for the book uh, before he passed away uh, was Roy Hazelwood, who was a legendary uh, criminal profiler at the FBI, one of the very beginning uh, – uh, architects. Um, and that was one of the questions I asked him, you know, are, are they born or are they made? Uh, and, and he laughed and he said, I, w I was waiting for you to ask me that question. And then he went on to tell me that um, the earliest that age that he had seen psychopathy manifest itself was um, the case of a three-year-old boy who had been caught by his mother in the uh, attempting the act of autoerotic asphyxiation. And that boy, he said, grew up to be a serial killer. Um, I really, really, really wanted to learn about Keyes' childhood because so little was known about it. And it took me five years. It took me that, that lawsuit against the federal prosecutor but I got the psychological evaluation, which was the result of, of a six and a half hour interview Keyes did with a, a, a forensic psychologist. Um, and that was a great self-report into how he grew up. And I also talked to his mother. I interviewed her several times and she had never talked to a reporter before. She has not since. But, um, you know, in brief, what I came away with was a, a brutal childhood. He was raised, uh, he's one of 10 children, raised by religious fundamentalists, 
off the gritters, deeply suspicious of the federal government. Um, Heidi, his mother, had all of her children at home. Her children never saw a doctor. They never went to school. They were raised in a remote corner of Washington State out in the woods. They lived in tents for about seven years while their father built a house by hand. Uh, They had to hunt game to eat. Um, he was, he was, he was breaking into homes, uh, for fun around age 10, stealing guns. Um, he was building bombs, um, which was an admission he made, uh, again, taunting the investigators, um, at a later point. And, uh, which also changed the designation of this case uh, from serial murder to terrorism, um, which is yet another mystery. Yeah. Um, That was going to be my next thing I asked you. Um, The, the secrecy um, that, that you kept uh, running into and the, um, you know, the, the level of people that, that didn't want to talk about it or that were, um, Making it difficult uh, to to get facts. I don't want to use the word obstruct, um, but it it had to have felt that way um, at some points. That that there's there's a story here that someone doesn't want out. Um, did you did you ever feel like that you finally got through what all the secrecy was about? I'm not quite sure. I have ideas. Um based on what I went through to get the information that I, I did get. And, um, you know, what was gratifying about this book and about fighting as long as I did was being able to tell a front to back narrative, uh, that also includes open cases, cold cases, unsolved cases that law enforcement very much has reason to believe he is responsible for and um, I, that I'm, that I'm hoping are reopened. Uh, what I'm also hoping is that this book puts pressure on uh, systems in Anchorage uh, that still have a lot to answer for in the way this case was uh, investigated uh, and conducted and handled. And uh, I, I am hoping that um we are also uh, told why this case became classified a terrorism case. What had Israel Keys done or what was he planning to do? Um, you cannot say that in a post-9-11 world, it is not in the public's interest, let alone right to know. Maureen, this is, this is a, a, a fascinating book. Um, this Thank is. You. Uh, I, I've, I've got so much more that, that I would love to talk about. We'll have to do it a, an, another day. Um, but if if people are just learning about you and, and your work, uh, is there a place where they can find you online uh, to dig into all you do? Yes, they can go uh, to my website, MaureenCallahan.net. Um, okay. And you can also find me, uh, you know, slumming around <laughs> anywhere. Um, books are sold. And I also I write for the New York Post uh, regularly, so you can find me there too. Great. Uh, the book American Predator is out everywhere now uh, in hardback, uh, in uh, Kindle edition. Is it also out in audiobook? It is, yes. Great, great. Um, we're going to send everybody to see you. Maureen, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. There's links to everything in the show notes of this episode. Thank you so much, Hank. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. No use crying over spilled milk. Eliza hated that cliché. She'd grown up a cliché. Her life, a bowl of cherries, duck soup, easy as pie, child's play behind a white picket fence. Mother had been the Wyatt Earp of clichés, firing them off, quick draw. A rotten apple spoils the barrel. Smile and the world smiles with you. Every dog has his day. Children should be seen and not heard. She believed them all, particularly this last. 
Eliza obliged, preferring to wander the streets of Wytheville, Virginia, on her own lonesome terms. The divorce left Laura a spinster librarian, and one false step on icy stairs left her an invalid as well. The accident happened on New Year's Eve, 1950. Laura had just locked the doors of Wytheville Public Library. We must make black-eyed peas tomorrow, Laura had been thinking, with turnip greens. That ensured a lucky New Year, and if you swept some money over your threshold, a prosperous one, too. She loved those old Southern traditions. She looked both ways, checking for Negroes, but turned to heel on the icy marble of the stairs and fell into the bushes below, breaking the long bones in both legs. Eliza had taken advantage of her mother's absence. She'd lost her virginity that same night. She'd swept Ron Partridge over her threshold, initiating her own beloved tradition. She was nursing a hangover, giddily reliving the event. But around 8.30, she realized that her mother had not come down to breakfast. She checked her mother's bedroom, found it empty, took the bus down to the library, climbed the high stairs, knocked hard on the library doors, and heard a groan below. Laura lay under the William Penn barberry bushes, below the yellow-trimmed windows of the non-fiction section. Her white stockings ran Jezebel red with blood. Sweat and melted snow had soaked her blouse, and her gray forehead blazed. The broken bones didn't kill Laura Merrick. She lay in the hospital, wheezing, her legs mortared up in casts. She had few visitors after the first week. Her church group was glad to fret over a poor thing for a day or two, but they trickled away when Laura had the bad manners to linger. On Valentine's Day, as her mother slept, Eliza drew big, sloppy hearts on her casts. Laura harumphed when she woke and insisted on keeping her legs hidden beneath blankets afterwards. But in late March, something miraculous happened. Laura's self-control dropped. She ranted at nurses, spit at doctors, swore like a Navy pilot dropping F-bombs on Hiroshima. She had dementia, the doctors said. Eliza decided that her mother had just stopped believing her own bullshit. The spells continued over the next two weeks, and Eliza enjoyed her mother's company for the first time. They swapped bawdy jokes, ogled the handsome interns, and chattered like best girlfriends late into the evening. They had long conversations, and Laura spoke her own mind in her own words about things that mattered to her. It broke Eliza's heart when the prim, condescending librarian returned. Laura hardly acknowledged anything that had passed between them. The clichés returned. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. A leopard doesn't change its spots. Nothing is certain except death and taxes. This last proved true. On April 15th, Laura Merrick marked her Bible with a tongue depressor, set it on her nightstand, leaned back against the headboard, and coughed blood down the front of her nightdress. Eliza found her that way dead as the proverbial doornail, and yes, the blood was thicker than water, just as her mother had always said. Much thicker than water, in fact, perhaps as thick as molasses in January. <laughs>